Okay, I'm told we're ready with Nashville Predators president and CEO Sean Henry, one of my favorite people in Nashville sports to deal <laughs> with over the last 10 years or so. How are you? Well, you're starting your first show ever off with a lie. I know I'm not even your favorite person with the Predators, let alone one of your favorite people <laughs> on the planet. Watson, why are you on the show with this liar? Well, no, no, wait a minute. When you said not even with the Predators, who are you referring to? Nat Harden, you like way more than you like me. Well, he was around when we needed him. Okay. Well, there you, you go. Were, you were in Tampa drawing big bucks. <laughs> well, congratulations, guys. It's great to see you. Thank you. It really is. And I am okay. so appreciative that you had me on to launch your first show ever. And today is the first show I hear, right? Second show. <laughs> I have said you, Sean. Time and time and time again. How am I not on the first show ever? This is like the 18th time with a new gig for you that you screwed me. Come on, man. I'm an opening day pitcher. I'm not a second day guy. <laughs> you are Jameson Tyon. That's sort of a Yankee deal. So hey. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a serious question right off the bat. You ready? Yeah, that's gonna really get people tuning in, man. Let's go serious. We're gonna okay. talk about the January sixth hearings or what? No. You want to talk about, you want to talk about you know serious? We're in sports, bro. Okay, and that's where I'm going. All right. Let's All get three of us in this picture have spent our entire lives in sports. And we are incredibly blessed to be able to say that. Sean, there are a bunch of kids out there, young adults, I guess would be the proper word, who are in things like sports administration programs at different schools. I don't know whether that's the route to go, but if you were going to give a young person a piece of advice, if they wanted to eventually do the things you have done, What's the piece of advice you'd give them? Probably like you guys, you hate giving that advice out because everyone's past a little bit different, but I, I don't know both of your stories exactly, but it's probably somewhat similar to mine that you took advantage of that first window of being in the door and you just try to work harder than anyone around you at the same time, help the people next to you. You know, for me, I came in through the food and beverage side of the business when I was 14 years old. Worked all through junior high, high school, and college. And I was fortunate that my company built a trainee program for me. And they happened to service sports teams around the nation. And uh, I was going to go to Detroit for three months to work in the Pistons account. And I never left. I was there. I stayed there five years. And then, of course, a few years later, after I left, they bought the uh, Lightning. And I came back to the organization um, to run the business side of the Lightning. And, you know, it doesn't matter what your first job is. You just work hard and um, do the right thing every day. Try to make the people around you a little bit better. And don't worry about what your title is or what you're getting paid. And that's easy to say now at, you know, 54 years of age. When I was 21, I wanted, you know, a, a different title and different money. Um, but maybe I was too shy, believe it or not, to ask for it. That was probably the best thing to happen to me. You know, people like, you know, people that just want to do more. And uh, I always love the fact I work for guys that the reward for doing a really good job is you got more to do. And I tell people that if you enjoy that and embrace that, the sky's the limit for you. Um, and let's face it, like you said, we're, we're all blessed to be in sports for a living. And if you have to work, there's not a better way, you know, to spend, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years than uh, being around, you know, the sports entertainment industry because it's upbeat and it's fun. And, most of the people in it are really, really good people. And, you know, people want to tune in, they want to come out and they want to talk about what we do for a living. And it, it's so much more fun. It really, really is. So, you know, it's kind of the golden rule, right? Work hard, be honest, and try to make the company better tomorrow than, than they were the day before. Sean, I've always believed if you dread Monday on Sunday, that's when you know you've got a big problem. And knowing you, I think I'm right in feeling that you never really feel like you've, quote, worked a day in your life, that this is fun. 
Yeah, there's no doubt. You know, there's obviously there are a handful of days that like all of us, you know, every once in a while you're, you're Fred Flintstone and you have a, a Mr. Slate around you. Um, and sometimes you have a few negative surprises you got to deal with, but they're so far and few between our industry that every day is fun. And, you know, I always laugh when people are like, oh, do you have to be at all the games and all the concerts? I was like, well, have to is a weird word. Yes, it's part of my job, but where else would I want to be? You know, it's just such a such a positive environment environment to be in. You're with people that are come in smiling and upbeat and they're passionate about your company. And uh, more often than not, my family's with me, too. So it's uh, just a great place to be. So you're right. I, I love coming to work. I mean, I like vacation, too. Don't get me wrong. But uh, work is so enjoyable. It really, really is. You get to work with people that when you were 12 years old, you never thought you'd be interacting you know, with fill in the blank, whoever it may be. And I always say we're all 12 year olds at heart. And uh, the day you forget that is the day you're probably going to lose your joy in working in sports. One of the best decisions, in my opinion, you all ever made was one that I absolutely butchered. Um, Jeff Kogan showed me the gold when you all decided to go gold. And I was like, this ain't going to work. And it has turned out to be one of the two or three best decisions you all ever made. And now you look and, and the whole arena is wearing gold. How did that thing actually get started? You know, Tom Seagram was our chairman um, in 09 or 2010. I forget exactly when. And uh, he had a very simple vision. You know, we're going to be an incredible team. We're going to do things that we haven't done yet. Uh, but we needed our own identity. You know, and, and when you look at the color palette or spectrum of uniforms across sports and you sit down at the time, Reebok was our, our uniform partner and we kind of sat down and, and we looked at the color wheel, if you will. And it didn't matter what the sport was. It didn't matter what the team was, you know, roughly 120 teams in professional sports. I think they presented us with 240 teams. So a handful of uh, tier one division one college schools, too. And you look at, OK, look at the colors and, you know, bar chart going across coming down bar graph and it was blacks and blues and reds and you know all these colors and you know each color you got got a little bit less a little bit less a little bit less and at the far right hand side were the color gold and then pink zero teams wear pink <laughs> and at the time there were two teams that had gold in their secondary logo or, or, or uniform and you know tom pointed that he said that's the color we need to embrace period because we're going to have something when you turn on our games, you're going to see a sea of gold and you'll know exactly who you're watching. You'll know it's going to be a home game like you do with the Flames, like you do with the Red Wings. Some of the teams that have five colors in their uniform, um, you, you don't quite see the same thing. So a lot of people thought we were wrong. You were one of them. Your good friend Jeff Kogan was one of them as well. Yes, he was. <laughs> oh, he told me, Sean, this is awful. You got to tell Tom not to do it. I said, well, Hey, I think it's a good idea. And again, regardless of what the color is, it's a good idea. And then you start looking at the attributes of the color. You know how near and dear pediatric cancer research is to our organization. What is the color of pediatric cancer? Come on, I laid it up for you. It's on a T. Gold. There you go. Hey. Uh, you know, what do we the, got, Johnny? Right. But you know, it's like you start looking at those things and you start layering that together and you kind of build up the, the whole storyline. Um, but you look at where we are now or who we are now and, and we're gold and the soccer team is gold. And it's always really neat when uh, a second team in the city shares a similar color to you, because it, you, when you go to a, um, a soccer game, you see people in soccer jerseys and kits and T-shirts and you see them in Preds jerseys because you go to your closet and you grab gold. And I think that's pretty neat. I really do. You see that in Pittsburgh. You see that in a few different cities. And uh, it, it really is fun. So it sure did work, though, didn't it? I mean, it's, uh, we oh, saturated the market. And I do remember telling Kogan, this isn't going to work. Oh, what a and visionary I, I am. I remember him telling me that over and over. George Plaster, the foremost expert in sports, says it'll never work. What are you <laughs> going to do now? We're going with it. So tell me this. When you're Look the president. That. Look at that. Oh, absolutely. And that's an old picture because that that's at least five years ago. But it's a beautiful picture. Beautiful. So 
Tell me this, when you're a president and a CEO, when do you get involved in on the on the ice, what direction are we going, and when are you absolutely not involved? Well, you're involved every day. And um, you know, David Poyle is our, our uh, general manager, president of hockey operations, and we're so fortunate to have him. He's, he's been doing this 40 years, all-time wins leader. Um, easy to criticize the, the general manager or the coach if the team doesn't win the cup, you know, period, or the Super Bowl or NBA championship or the World Series. Um, but that comes with the territory. But uh, David and I probably talk on average three times a day, seven days a week, um, almost to the point of annoyance to his wife and mine or other meetings we're in. Uh, what I love about our relationship is we don't have a set meeting um, because I think for what I do, if you set a meeting, sometimes you, you'll wait three days or four days for the next scheduled time to get together. And uh, we need to do it a lot more often. Um, but, you know, we were, we were constantly talking about, you know, what the makeup of the team looks like today, tomorrow, three years from now, 10 years from now, where we're going, you know, where do we need to invest in? You know, where are we from data analytics to video research to our coaches, to our team support services? Where should we invest some more? Should we renovate Centennial? How are we traveling? Where are we going? What are the holes on the roster? How do we fill them? What does that look like? Um, and I, I'm more of a soundboard for him, but uh, I just enjoy how we challenge each other. And it's 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 been wonderful to work with. Yeah, if you had to script a great partner on the sports side of the business, you can't find a better partner on David Poyle. I mean, he's forgotten more about hockey than most of us will ever know. Um, but he comes at it with such a, uh, a well-planned, well-thought-out um, view of what we could do, what we should do. It's so creative. Um, and, you know, he doesn't care if he gets credit. He doesn't, he doesn't care how people see his approach. What he cares about is always trying to put the team a little bit more forward than we were yesterday. And Sean, the interview will get better after the break because then I shut up and Watson gets into it and you all can comment that the questions are better. Talk to me a little bit about Ford Ice Centers that you have been at the forefront of putting together and how important those are in growing this sport in this area. You know, my answer is going to surprise you. It normally does most people. Um, the, building the first Ford Ice Center wasn't truly about growing the sport and building future fans. Um, Jeff Kogan and I used to kind of have a playful disagreement about that all the time. He would always call them fan factories. And maybe they are, maybe they're not. But it, to me, it was always a little bit bigger than that. You know, when we worked with Carl Dean on, on building the first one and selecting the site for the second one, it was really modeling um, Mayor Bredesen, Governor Bredesen's vision of using quote unquote civic furniture and by placing that in different parts of town, you can spur on economic development. I'm a, obviously a huge believer in our game. And I think any child that plays the game of hockey instantly, instantly becomes a better teammate. They instantly become a better student. If a football player plays hockey, he or she becomes a better football player. If a volleyball player also plays hockey, they become a better volleyball player for a lot of reasons. Um, but it was, to quote Vince Gill, it was about giving more kids more good choices. And as he always says, if you give a kid a good choice or a bad choice, they'll never break your heart. They'll always pick a good choice. If you give a child no choice, well, then they might pick something, you know, that you don't want them to do. So we built the first one in Antioch and we built it in, you know, a, a, an empty mall right next to it. The idea was, what can we do in Antioch? It was going in the wrong direction for too many years. Um, you had a handful of people really trying to make Antioch different than where it was. Uh, ben Freeland, probably no one bigger fan than, than him. And he was the one that really encouraged us to work with, with Ford, believe it or not, even though we had a Chevy dealership across right. the street. He cared about Antioch. A lot of people do. And we dropped that and opened it up. And Antioch has changed ever since then, without exception. Built a park, a rec center, a library, Ford Ice Center. Uh, Nashville State went in there as well, and it's different. But then what it also did is broke down a few barriers geographically to open up our game to kids that don't look like mine, 
And that was really important and really special too, is we work on, you know, who's playing our game, who becomes fans of our games. Building Fordyce Center in Antioch was more about that than anything else. Oh, and by the way, we are growing our youth hockey participation at a faster clip than any other market in the United States and have for about seven years. Coincidentally, what happened eight years ago, we opened up the first Fordyce Center, opened up the second Fordyce Center in the fall of 2019. Same thing, the west side of town, so the east side of town, get a little bit closer to a few more people in a burn or a, a, an empty mall and spurred on you know that development. Now we're opening one in Sumner County, probably will be up and running in about 18 months. Rumor is, I have not confirmed this rumor yet, there is one happening in Williamson County. Um, you know, you can read about it in your newspaper. I won't comment much further on it. And then we're building um, <laughs> F&M Bank Arena, which features two sheets of ice and will be the future home of Austin P. you know, uh, men and women's basketball. And we're working with TSU to see uh, if we can bring a Division I men and women's hockey program to TSU's campus, which would be really special. So to do it, you need more ice, but it's not about building future fans. That's a good byproduct. It really is. It's about creating these miniature economic engines for municipalities and counties that want to do something special. Same thing Bridgestone Arena did for downtown. These small Bridgestone Arenas do in the communities they're in, and it makes our game a little bit easier for more people to play. My favorite question people ask, and maybe you're going to go there, is, well, how many is enough? Then I laugh. I said, I, I don't know. Like, how many Fritos are enough, right? Their slogan is, <laughs> you know, just keep eating them. We'll make more. And, you know, it's an insatiable demand. The, the more we open, the more need there is. But what I love is, you know, I, I, I love sports, and you know that. And it's just a central figure in everything I, I am, on my family's life. I've never chastised a city for having too many little league fields, soccer fields, open fields. And it's the same with, with hockey. There's no reason that every town doesn't have a community rink. And I really mean that. St. Louis has done a great job. In, and it started, when I got there, I had nothing to do with it. I worked with the Rams back then, but they're called um, met, Metro Centers or Recplexes. And, and not every town, but I don't even know how many, 15 towns have a Recplex. It's a combination of softball, baseball, uh, inline skating, uh, ice hockey, basketball. And it's the rec center that we all had growing up, but they've added ice to it. There's no reason that we don't have the same thing. Stop there. We'll have more with Sean Henry. Watson Brown will take over. Watson, steal a couple of extra minutes if you want. This is the George Plaster Show on Main Street Media TV. I love the ending to that commercial. We welcome all of you back. Nashville Predators President and CEO Sean Henry with us. You could feel the passion in him as he talked about those Ford Ice Centers. Watson, steal a couple of extra minutes and go at it. Sean, it was interesting to listen to you talk because all three of us had to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. And with me, I'm... I've gotten injured. I can't finish a career. I don't know what I want to do. You know, I'm, I'm one of those that's stuck. And my coach was let go and in comes Steve Sloan, uh, a guy that had recruited me out of Alabama. And I stay on as the only helper GA that they had. And it was Steve Sloan, Rex Dockery and Bill Parcells. Wow. And what a start for me. I was breaking down everything for all three of them. Uh, Steve got me my first job with Pat Dye. It's, it's a, it, without that help, I don't know where I would have gone or where I would be. Who were the people in your young life that really got you started and then you, you took off from there? Yeah, again, I'm I'm so fortunate. You know, I'm the youngest of six kids, and if we're going to go to college, we're going to pay for it ourselves. You know, we're first generation students, and uh, I was so fortunate. My very first job at 14, 15 years old, our general manager was a gentleman named uh, Bill Butler. His his younger brother was Frank Butler. They were, were my mentors. I mean, their job was to make sure I went to school. I learned some things. They thought they were raising young men and women much more so than selling hot dogs or whatever they did. Yeah. And if it weren't for uh, th those guys, I never would have been introduced at a higher level uh, to people in the organization that built the trainee program for me while I was still in college. I was a full-time employee in college. 
And then to be sent to Detroit, the brand new home of the Detroit Pistons, they changed our industry. They invented our industry, the Pistons did. And there were two people there, Tom Wilson, who's the CEO of the Pistons for gosh, 25 years. Then he went to the Red Wings for about uh, 10 years. But Tom was our CEO, Ron Campbell was our CFO. Ron became our president in Tampa and then hired me as the COO. Those two guys gave me more opportunity and a rope to hang myself with or swing, and sometimes it was both, than I ever deserved. And uh, I, I learned from two of the very best in this industry. And I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful for it. The funny thing is you talk about the full circle nature of being recruited and then hired by somebody is uh, Bill Butler's nephew, Danny Butler, runs our Fordyce centers. <laughs> Ron Campbell's son, our CFO, his son interned with us, he lived with us, and then he went to work for the Sounds, and now he works at the Lightning. I mean, it, it's such a great industry of, you know, people continue to open doors for each other, and then it's up to you to, you know, break them down and, and go through. But it, it is so much fun that, you know, Danny Butler, for example, can literally tell stories about Tom Wilson, who helped me. You know, he's kind of in that tree now, if you will, like the coaching tree. Tom Wilson started selling tickets in a building that was brand new called the Great Western Forum in L.A. Wow. You know, so he goes back, you know, 50, 50, 60 years, wherever it may be. And I, I love when people talk about coaching trees, right? Yeah. Well, there's also a sports management tree here, here, there. And I'm pretty proud to find myself in, in Ron Campbell's and Tom Wilson's. Well, it, it's neat. And I don't know that we all uh, talk about that enough uh, because oh. – you know that just just the start is, is so important and it's really neat to hear yours something else always interests me i wanted to ask you when i first thought that hockey wouldn't go in the south i'm one of these old football dudes that hey if you don't if you're not in college football there's not there's nothing else um you were a part of T tampa and nashville and and both of them unbelievable franchises now did you believe that would happen when you jumped into this are you a little surprised by it talk a little about that you know I, when we got to tampa and then we we had all the arrogance in the world i know that's shocking to everyone that i i came in with a little confidence and um but you know we were the detroit pistons we changed the industry we own the two busiest amphitheaters in the country one of the busiest arenas in the country the pistons sold out I don't even know, 800 straight games, won back-to-back -back championships, eight straight conference, you know, finals. I mean, it was, we were a very successful organization. We thought we'd show up in Tampa and get out of the way. You know, we'd snap our fingers and sell everything out. We did not realize how, how beaten down that market was. I mean, it was the worst sports city in America by far. You know, the Buccaneers were the worst team in sports. We took that title from them and then the Rays took it from us. I mean, it was, three of the most failed franchises in their respective sport. And then a weird thing happened. We all got new ownership. The Buccaneers and us, we started working together on marketing and having fun and our players interacting a little bit more. And in a, a few short years, they won the Super Bowl in 03. We won the Stanley Cup in 04. The Rays made the World Series a few years later. Unfortunately, didn't win yet. But pretty quickly, it became a great sports market. It was so much fun. But I always knew it could be there. It's a much bigger market than most people realized back then. Now it's one of the top 10 biggest markets in the country. But everyone that lived in Tampa, if they were from there, they were college football fans to begin with. If they were from somewhere else, they were baseball and football and, and hockey and basketball fans, right? You, you don't give up your fandom just because you move. It was our job to make them Lightning fans, our job to make them Buck fans and Rays fans. And I, I see the same thing here. How lucky were we as a franchise to come into a market that live events were so important, whether that be music, college football, college basketball, college baseball, minor league baseball, and of course, NASCAR. I mean, everyone in this market loves getting together to party and celebrate something. And our job was just to tap into it a little bit and get out of the fans' way. Did the fans say they want to chant that a goalie sucks and it's his fault? Let's celebrate that. You know, if our fans want to light up their flashlights on a goal review for Let It Be for the Paul McCartney song. I mean, the best things that we're known for, we had nothing to do with except applaud it and, and smile and have a little bit of fun. So am I surprised? I'm a little surprised that 
about the sustained support, the passion sustained support in all the newer markets, because it's hard. You, know, you got to get through that first 20 years and get that second generation. And a lot of teams don't last those first 20 years. I mean, there's a lot of relocations in a lot of different sports because you have to see it through. And it's not about winning. All, I mean, winning is the most important thing in the world to me, period. But when you're building a fan base, winning makes it easier. But it's it's really connecting with people in a pretty deep way and making sure that when their kids and grandkids come along, their first and only choice is your team and that team. That's where we are right now. You know, we're coming up on our 25th season, our 24th anniversary. And um, it, it, it's just been so much fun to watch it continue to grow and develop. When I came here for the first time in maybe 02 or 03 for a game, there were probably only nine or 10,000 people in the building, but you could tell the excitement and the enthusiasm and the passion and the knowledge. And uh, I, I, was, I was so excited to come here for the opportunity. I just didn't realize what a great place it was gonna be to live too. So yeah, I, I always thought it was possible, but when I'm being really honest, I am always a little bit surprised about the all-star game that we did with you know 30,000 people outside watching the game and the free concerts, 100,000 people down Broadway that set the stage to bring the NFL draft on board. And it, it's a city that will always surprise you by showing up in a bigger way than you ever thought possible. And that's response to the flood, response to the tornado, response to great events. So it's such a wonderful place to be, isn't it? Yep, it is. George, I got time for another. Are we done? You got well, Oh, Billy is Bill. calling shots. He just gave it the no. We got to go. Hey, this is his second day, and he's telling us what to do. I'm just following the script, George. No, what I, in the world? Sean, what would you do with that? Well, I mean, Billy, Derek, I mean, you're one of the royal families in Nashville. You can't just cut <laughs> us off this way, can you? <laughs> I mean, shouldn't he have to go to confession? <laughs> Well, I, I, I don't know. I think I go to confession at Derek's home. I mean, they're, they're one of the five you know, reigning families. Yeah, I'll make sure I'll make sure my mom knows that I cut you guys off. <laughs> no, please do, because I'm calling her on the way home. I'm like, you won't believe what Billy did. <laughs> cut us off. Uh, Sean, George, thank you for taking the time to come on here. Do you want to hear Billy do his little read? Well, before I do, I just want to thank you both. And, you know, Billy, for uh, making sure I turn my camera on and making this so easy. And I'm really excited about the show. What you guys are doing is exciting. It's fun. Love talking and listening to uh, local sports. So I really appreciate what you guys are both doing. So thank you. It absolutely thank won't you. be the last time we ask you. Nope. <laughs> Might be it the last time be. I say yes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Look at that. <laughs>